Now, this is a five week long uh, series. If you have not seen the agenda of our training, uh, what you see here is basically uh, title of each of those five weeks. So today we are going to talk about remote sensing, fundamental of remote sensing. Next week we'll talk about satellite imageries. In week three we'll talk about the aerosols data which can be related to particulate matter air quality and then the trace case uh, data sets will be talked in week four. And in the week five basically we will review all the material and then provide you what are the upcoming future satellite missions to help uh, air quality monitoring. So this is, so let's talk about fundamental of satellite remote sensing. So the first questions uh, come to our mind is what is remote sensing? So remote sensing is uh, the science of obtaining information about an object or an area from a distance and one of the simplest uh, example of remote sensing sensor is our eye is actually a natural uh, remote sensing sensors which can obtain information uh, about an object from distance so this is one of the simplest example a uh, simple photographic camera is another most frequently used remote sensing sensor uh, which can capture images uh, and record them from distance so these are really great example of uh, how uh, remote sensing sensor works uh, and what they really do. Looking more into detail and going into satellite things, so remote sensing instrument uh, again collects information about object or event within the instantaneous field of view. So in this picture, what you see here is a object sitting on the earth which are some vegetations and then you have a remote sensing sensors uh, installed or located on a suborbital platform like a space uh, like a aircraft or a spacecraft like satellite and it is looking down uh, and then when it looks down the height of the satellite or the plate sensors really does decide a lot of uh, quality and quantity of information you can get and then the instantaneous field of view also make play an important role in deciding how accurately or high precisely you can get certain information about the object moving forward these uh, remote sensing uh, sensors or instrument uh, can be uh, placed in many different platforms uh, your application basically uh, help you decide which platform is most useful to you. Uh, there are several questions that need to be answered uh, to determine which platform is most useful, such as uh, how much detail do you need and how frequently do you need this information. Uh, these in the pictures what you see are examples of uh, remote sensing sensors which are placed either on some kind of a vehicle which is moving and you can make measurements uh, uh, of certain area while uh, moving around this vehicle so you can put those sensors as well you can also put the sensors on the balloon uh, which can fly up in the atmosphere and take measurement in different altitudes or different height in the atmosphere and these are really very useful uh, when you want to get information about atmospheric component in at a different height you can also fly airplanes uh, with remote sensing sensors and they also are very useful uh, for getting a specific information over a specific area and then the satellite is of course uh, one of the most uh, useful remote sensing sensor which you can put on. Uh, I'll be focusing mostly on satellite remote sensing in this presentation and discussing how this uh, works in this uh, series of the uh, webinar series. So before we start uh, uh, understanding the remote sensing process, uh, it is uh, important to understand something about the source of energy or the information carrier 
in uh, when we talk about the remote sensing. So uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, travels through the space in form of waves uh, and it originates from the, in our case, uh, we are mostly talking about the sun's solar energy. The waves have different lengths in different part of the spectrum. Uh, as you can see here uh, in this chart on the right side of the slide, that uh, this electromagnetic spectrum has a different wavelength. Uh, although we are talking about light, most of electromagnetic spectrum uh, we cannot detect by human eyes. So if you look this spectrum, it is very wide and visible is just one tiny part of this spectrum, which we or human can see through the eyes. Uh, as you go towards ultraviolet X-ray and gamma rays, the wavelength decreases. And as you move from uh, left from the visible, like a microwave, radio waves, infrared, the wavelength increases. And for your, uh, just to give an analogy to check the size of this wavelength, we have some, uh, some of the reference material which you can correlate to this uh, length of this uh, radiation. And most of the uh, remote sensing sensors uh, uh, for air quality, uh, specifically for particles, they work in the visible part of the solar spectrum. Uh, there are some which can provide information in ultraviolet. Uh, and then we also use infrared to detect some other uh, atmospheric phenomena. So this electromagnetic radiation is very, very, very important. Uh, in uh, understanding the satellite remote sensing and how it works and how the information is carried. So depending on the purpose, uh, different satellite uh, capture a specific portion of this entire electromagnetic spectrum uh, which we use. Now, the next thing is to understand is how satellite and sensors collect this information. So, uh, optical or passive remote sensing depends on the sun as a sole of uh, source of illumination or the source of energy as we discussed in the previous slide. And this solar radiation uh, as it emits from the source sun, it passes through the atmosphere and it interact with the atmospheric component. Uh, it also interact with the objects which are located on the surface. So in this case, either it's vegetations, water bodies, bare soil, uh, build up areas, buildings, uh, parks, everything which is located on the surface, the incoming solar radiation interact. And now once the incoming solar radiation interact, depending on the property of the incoming solar radiation, which means the wavelength, and depending on the property of these objects, uh, it will either absorb by those objects or reflect back to the space. So the radiation which reflect back to the space is captured by the satellite which is sitting in the space. And this reflected solar radiation is measured in different wavelengths with very precise accuracy by the satellite sensors uh, in this space. And the different sensors collect uh, this radiation in different wavelengths uh, depending on uh, what's the purpose of that particular instrument. Uh, the intensity of uh, reflected and emitted radiation uh, to space is influenced by the surface. So it can influence by the ocean, uh, if there is a snow ice on the surface that can influence um, very bright areas such as desert can influence uh, forest or vegetation can influence in a different way so each this surface property type of surface influence the incoming solar radiation in different ways and of course the atmospheric condition also influence this uh, incoming solar radiation uh, different temperature influence in different ways amount of water vapor, uh, humidity in the atmospheres, uh, clouds, rain, uh, aerosols or the particles in the atmosphere uh, interact with the solar radiation and influence it. So different wavelengths respond to different geophysical quantities uh, uh, and the physical properties of the surface uh, or the atmosphere. 
for example significant uh, amount of solar radiation is uh, reflected back to space uh, by snow ice or cloud uh, as compared to vegetation so if you have a cloud or a snow and that's why we see them very bright object when we look the satellite image and we'll see some of those example in week two when we look into the satellite imagery uh, in more detail uh, one thing to understand when working with the satellite data is that uh, this reflected or emitted radiation uh, from the Earth's surface must travel through the atmosphere uh, before it reaches to the satellite. So sometime, uh, depending on again application, we have to do this corrections to the satellite data for these atmospheric conditions. And in most cases, uh, we have to perform this kind of uh, correction. So uh, to op to make sure that we are retrieving information uh, which is relevant to our use. And this atmospheric uh, corrections are often very useful for air quality studies uh, because uh, for air quality, we are trying to obtain information about the particle or gases which are in the atmosphere. So when we talk about the air quality information, instead of correcting for the atmospheric condition, uh, we have to correct for the surface conditions. So if surface is bright, if there is a vegetation, we have to uh, take into account uh, uh, the contribution from the surface and take out that from the total signal. Uh, so depending on your application, whether you are trying to get information about the atmosphere or land, uh, you have to make corrections either for atmosphere or for the land. Uh, for air quality application, we have to mostly do correction for the land and of course for atmosphere as well uh, again it depends on what is our interest within the atmosphere either we are looking for clouds or aerosols or trace gas um, any of those will require some kind of uh, corrections to the signal and these corrections we do using theoretical calculation and uh, using other ancillary data sets and we make some assumptions as well so once uh, satellite make measurement of this uh, uh, radiance in different uh, wavelength which we call spectral radiance uh, we use a prior information and ready to transfer calculations uh, to generate simulate what satellites should supposed to make measurement and then we combine these two piece of information in something we call retrieval algorithm and these algorithms are mostly inversion algorithm where we try to match satellite measured radiance with a priori or theoretically calculate radiance and come up with the geophysical quantities uh, such as temperature, wind speed, water vapor, relative humidity, you know, aerosol number of particles, concentrations or trace gas concentrations or aerosol optical depth which is term which we often use for air quality and which will uh, go into more detail in week three uh, we retrieve this geophysical parameter and since it does involve a a prior information and theoretical calculation uh, there are some assumptions which goes into that and that can create some of uncertainty in the retrieval of this geophysical parameters so different uh, product have different uncertainties or different errors in their uh, when from a specific satellite or a specific algorithm uh, which needs to be taken into account when you use this data sets and depending on what product and application uh, we can apply for different applications so we can use this product for example to monitor smoke from certain region or how the smoke is transporting or how dust is transporting from Saharan desert to over Atlantic and to the east coast of uh, the United States or in some other parts of the world. So those kind of application can be very uh, easily uh, done using the satellite data and we will see those more example uh, as we move forward in the webinar series in week two, three and four. Now let's do very quickly a break and choose uh, uh, before uh, we move on. So I have few questions uh, here again in form of poll and let's take uh, about 30 sec 
one minute time to answer these. Uh, and these are just based on what we have looked so far in terms of the number of in the slides. Uh, and there are three questions. One is uh, on the remote sensing instrument can be installed on the rooftop of a building. Uh, true or false statement. Second is the incoming solar radiation in all wavelength interact with the Earth atmosphere system in an identical manner or so again true or false statement. And then satellite can carry multiple sensors on board. Uh, this is something you know, which we haven't discussed here, uh, but uh, just make a guess and then we will discuss this a little bit more uh, in coming slides. So just few more, maybe 15 more seconds and then I will close these three questions. Okay, so let's, uh, the remote sensing instrument can be installed on rooftop of building. The answer is true. Uh, again, it depends on the instrument, uh, technical aspect and what we are trying to do. So the correct answer is true. The second question is incoming solar radiation in all wavelength interact with Earth atmosphere system in identical manner. Uh, this is a false statement. Uh, so they does interact in different ways because it depends on the wavelength and it also depends on the property of the Earth atmosphere system. And the third question is a satellite can carry multiple sensors. Most people have answered it correctly. Uh, it's yes, it's a true statement and we'll talk about that a uh, little bit in a few more slides. So with that, let's uh, move on. To continue, uh, let's talk about satellite sensors and some of the orbits. Uh, some of this terminology is important to understand uh, because uh, when you start using the satellite data, you will often hear these terminologies. And if we don't understand, we can misrepresent the data and we can misinterpret uh, the results of our analysis. So, uh, Earth observing satellite typically have names such as the one listed here. Uh, there are aqua satellite and other satellites. And uh, these uh, remote sensing instruments actually, uh, so there are two terms here. Uh, one is satellite and one is sensor. So the satellite is basically a platform uh, on which we install sensors or instrument. So uh, satellite is kind of a carrier for the sensors uh, on which we install these sensors. So uh, satellite can be, one satellite can have multiple instrument. In this case, for example, in aqua satellite, we have six instrument. And on the other hand, we have an, another satellite, Aura satellite, which have four instrument. Uh, aqua satellite, the two of the highlighted uh, modis and airs, are sensors which provide some kind of information on air quality. The Aura satellite is designed to actually get information about atmospheric chemistry and it has four different instrument uh, which provide different pieces of uh, atmospheric uh, uh, information. For example, OMI uh, is ozone monitoring instrument. It is designed to monitor uh, atmospheric ozone. It does also provide information about absorbing aerosols and other things. And then there are other instruments which does provide uh, different pieces of information. So remember the satellites are the platform on which sensors are installed. Uh, so sensors are also called instruments. So when we talk about the specific data, it comes from the specific sensors or the instrument. Uh, which can be on board on either one satellite or multiple satellite. And we'll see example of that in coming weeks. Uh, satellite and sensors can be classified or characterized in many different ways. Uh, uh, satellite, we can uh, classify it by their orbit bits. Uh, we, can talk, we can characterize by its source of energy. 
uh, we can also characterize by in which part of the solar spectrum they make the measurement. Uh, there are different measurement techniques which can also be used to classify these sensors. And important thing is the resolution. And we'll talk about this thing. There are several different types of resolution uh, which can also be used to uh, characterize this instrument. And the last uh, but most important is the application. Uh, you must have heard the term weather satellite, land satellite, ocean satellite, atmospheric satellite. So depending on our radiation satellite, depending on what is the purpose of that satellite, a specific satellite mission, uh, we can actually classify them in different based on the application. And I'll discuss this, some of these in upcoming slides. Uh, before going into details, one other thing uh, which is very common uh, is uh, orbits. So there are primary two types of orbit. Uh, Earth observing satellite, uh, so as the geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit. In the low Earth orbit, the common orbit is called polar orbiting, and then there are few others, uh, non polar orbiting, which uh, is not relevant to the air quality right now. So I'm not going to talk into more detail about those. But the geostationary orbit is uh, generally a high Earth orbit. Uh, which approximately about 36,000 kilometer above the Earth's surface. So any satellite which is in the geostationary orbit is located around 36,000 kilometer above the Earth's surf, Earth surface. It is always in the same position with respect to the rotating Earth by orbiting at the same rate uh, in the same direction as the Earth. So the satellite in following those rules appears stationary uh, corresponding to a specific region of the Earth. Uh, this geostationary or geosynchronous satellite provide frequent measurement and are extremely valuable for weather monitoring uh, because you can give, uh, get a constant view of the same surface area uh, with high frequency every 10 minute, 30 minute, one hour, depending on what satellite you are talking about, uh, they provide. Uh, since these satellites cover only one area on the Earth, uh, several satellites uh, are needed to cover the entire Earth. So the limitation of geostation satellite is they are located over one specific region. For example, uh, United States has a geostation sa satellite called GOES, which does provide image like this, which is shown here uh, on the left side every 30 minute or every one hour, but it's only over this region. It does not provide cover any other part of the world. So these are the limitations of the geostation satellite. Uh, most Earth uh, remote sensing satellite uh, are low Earth orbit, uh, which is, and these low Earth orbit are basically uh, polar orbit. Uh, polar orbiting satellites uh, provide a more uh, global view of Earth. Uh, these satellites move around the Earth from pole to pole, as you see in the picture here. Uh, they move, and then the Earth, as the satellite moves around the pole, the Earth turns underneath it and allowing complete coverage of the Earth. So instead of uh, satellite rotating around the Earth, satellite rotates uh, pole to pole, and Earth underneath it rotates, and that way it gives uh, it the satellite sees different part of the earth in different time and that's how it can cover a uh, different part of the earth uh, the satellite passes the equator and each uh, latitude at the same solar uh, local solar time each day uh, meaning uh, that satellite passes uh, overhead at essentially the same local solar solar time throughout all the season of the year. So this actually enable regular data collection at consistent time as well as long-term comparison. So polar orbiting satellite does make uh, almost daily, depending on again other factors, uh, global uh, measurement at the same solar local time. So this uh, basically provide a consistent long-term data series uh, which we can use for uh, applications such as trend analysis and other uh, 
other uh, understanding other features of the atmosphere. Uh, here an example of uh, showing uh, the difference between uh, uh, geostationary and, uh, and polar orbiting satellites. So uh, what you see here is a PM 2.5 microgram on the y-axis and then the time on the x-axis. And this is just a hypothetical case uh, where if you have a geostation satellite, you can get every 30 minute one hour observations um, throughout the day time of the uh, uh, time. Uh, but if you have a polar orbiting satellite, then you will only get one or two or three depending on how many satellites uh, you have in the orbit. So here we have this vertical lines represent one observation from Terra satellite, which is again a air quality sensors, um, air quality satellite, which carries several sensors. And it does provide you a morning observations. Uh, there is another satellite, Aqua, which we see earlier, uh, provides another observation at 1.30 in the afternoon. So you get global coverage from the polar orbiting satellite, but uh, less frequent observation. Uh, whereas you get more frequent observation from the geostationary, but you get only a specific, specific area or region covered. Some of the upcoming geostationary satellite uh, specifically designed to do air quality monitoring uh, are TEMPO from the United States and NASA, James from the Korea, uh, Sentinel-4 from the Europe, and they will form a constellation of satellite, uh, which we'll talk more details into week five. The south width uh, or the coverage uh, is another important aspect, and this determines uh, uh, their uh, frequency of observations and the global coverage. So this is defined by the ex uh, spatial extent of the satellite orbit for which the measurements are taken. Um, here is a comparison of the spatial coverage across the surface of the Earth uh, from the most common uh, sensor uh, used for air quality application, uh, specifically for monitoring uh, aerosols or particulate matter. So what you see here are uh, four different sensors uh, which does provide information on uh, atmospheric aerosols. Uh, the Veer's instrument is have a swath width of about 3,000 kilometer. Modis instrument, uh, which is another instrument, which we will talk a little bit more into detail in week two also, has about 2,300 kilometer swath width. And then Miser, which is another instrument which has uh, uh, multi-angle capabilities, is 380 kilometer swath width. And then we have a Calypso, which is a active lidar in the space, um, has very uh, narrow swath width. It's almost a uh, one kilometer because this is an active sensor. And again, we will talk about this when we go into the aerosol product in week three. But what is important here to understand is that different sensors have a different uh, swath width or the spatial coverage. Uh, and that actually determine their global coverage, their frequency of observation over a particular location, or the detail of the information they can get about the air quality. Uh, here an example of these three uh, sensors which we just talked in the previous slide. So if you look the MODIS one day coverage, then what you see here is on the top is basically is one day coverage of MODIS and what you see this black area are the gaps in the data due to the orbit gap so and then when you go to the VIRS which has a wider swath uh, 3000 kilometer as compared to 2300 kilometer compared to MODIS you see there are no gaps in the data okay so all the during the daytime area over the entire globe is covered by the VIRS so this is a one day coverage from the VIRS so VIRS has a much more coverage than the MODIS and if we go to the MISER which has a 380 kilometer swath width then you can see that there is a huge area this all this black area is actually data gaps in the MISER so because of this uh, 
narrow swath width of miser uh, it does uh, take longer time seven to eight days uh, to cover the entire globe uh, and this time period also varies over actually different uh, latitude wells uh, depending on where you are interested on the uh, surface of earth Another important aspect of satellite remote sensing is to understand whether the sensors are passive or active. Uh, most of air quality sensors are passive except few of them. Uh, remote sensing system that measure naturally available energy are called passive sensors. So in this picture you see a satellite is there, it's making measurement of the earth atmosphere system, but it is using sun's energy to make those measurements. So sun's energy, like we talked earlier, go through the atmosphere, get reflected back to the space, satellite makes measurement, and that's how the passive sensors make the measurement. It does not have its own source of energy. It uses sun or earth emitted radiation. Some of the examples of these uh, passive sensors, which we just looked previously, MODIS, MISER, OMI, uh, VIRS, these are all passive sensors. Uh, on the other hand, active sensors uh, emits radiation that is directed towards the target to win uh, object uh, or any uh, component on the earth, which we need to get investigated or which about which we want to obtain information. And then that radiation reflected back uh, from that op target uh, and is detected and measured by the sensor. So active sensors have their own source of energy. So uh, they are most likely LIDAR or radar, uh, which transmit energy or electronic radiation in certain part of the solar spectrum band. And then it travels through the atmosphere, interact with the atmospheric component or the land surface on the earth, and then reflect back to the sensor. And then there is a huge telescope uh, mounted on the satellite, which uh, capture that radiation which is reflected back. And by making that measurement, you get more accurate information uh, because in this case, we are uh, our source of energy is known, uh, very well characterized. And this also helps uh, to get the, because this energy, depending on the time to travel it back, we can estimate uh, different layer of the atmosphere. We can get the information about different uh, uh, layers of the atmosphere or different altitude. Uh, Calypso, Calypso is one of the example of first satellite is a two wavelength active lidar in the space, uh, which does provide important information about uh, clouds, aerosols, uh, different types of aerosols, uh, and many other, other information which can be relevant for air quality monitoring, specifically transport activities in different altitude of the atmosphere. Okay, moving on to the resolution. Um, resolution are also very important uh, aspect of satellite remote sensing. And there are different types of resolution, spatial, temporal, spectral, and radiometric resolution. And we'll go by one by one to these and see uh, you know, what they mean. Uh, depending on the satellites, uh, its orbit configuration, um, its sensor design, uh, they can be different for different sensors. And this is one of the most uh, important aspect when we use the satellite data uh, for air quality application. Uh, before defining this uh, resolution, uh, I would like to define a term which you will often hear when you use the satellite data is called pixels. Uh, this is the smallest unit of an image in simplest word if you want to learn it. So what you see here is on left is a satellite image. And if you take any part of this image, this image is divided into uh, array of this small unit. And each of this unit is called actually a pixel. Uh, these are the smallest unit of this image. Uh, they are arranged in column and rows. Uh, and every uh, digital image is basically comp uh, comprised of two uh, dimensional array of individual picture element. And these are we called uh, pixel. Uh, and this is more a technical uh, uh, definition. 
but essentially each of these pixels uh, represent certain area on the surface of the earth uh, each pixel has an intensity value and location address in terms of latitude and longitude uh, in this two dimensional image uh, the spatial resolution of any satellite or any image is defined by the size of this pixel. So this pixel size could be in centimeter, meter, kilometer, depending on what satellite we are looking at. So, and to look into more detail about the importance of the size of this pixel or the spatial resolution, here I have a picture uh, taken by uh, uh, a low, low orbiting platform uh, such as the aircraft in different spatial resolution over a, a locations on the earth. Uh, what you see here, the first image is taken uh, by a instrument uh, which has a spatial resolution or a pixel size of half meter resolution. And what you can see in this image very clearly uh, all the different uh, features uh, on the Earth's surface. As you move to the right of these images, uh, the spatial resolution start decreasing or the pixel size, in other words, started increasing. So 1 meter, 2.5 meter, 5 meter, 10 meter, 20 meter, uh, and it goes up to 80 meter. But what you see here is as we start increasing the pixel size, or as we start, in other words, decreasing the spatial resolution, the clarity or the ability to distinguish different uh, part of the image clearly uh, start, we start getting the image more fuzzier haziness. So uh, you can see at five meter resolution, you can still see some features, but when you go to the 10 meter resolution, things get started very fuzzy. And it really depends on how much detail you want to get information about these things. So spatial resolution really plays an important role in identifying different features uh, on the Earth's surface. Mm. Uh, spatial resolution is more important uh, when we try to get information about the land surface. Here are the, some of the sensors uh, which are used for air quality application and the spatial resolution varies from 250 meter to 13 by 24 kilometer, again, depending on which sensor and which product we are trying to use. Uh, another term is a spectral resolution. Spectral resolution describes the ability of a sensors to define the fine wavelength interval. Uh, the finer the spectral resolution, the narrower the wavelength range for which a particular uh, channel or band is making measurement. Uh, the, in this example here, there are two different uh, example. One is the black and white. So if you have a uh, band which is all the way starting from 0 0.4 to 0 0.7, and what you will get in the entire band is basically black and white film type of. So you have a band with, which is very broad, all the way from 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 nanometers. So the value you will get is only black and white film type. But if you divide this same uh, bandwidth into three different spectral band, uh, blue, green, and red, uh, and you can make measurement in three, this specific band, then you get a three piece of information. And when you combine this three piece of information, you get a colored uh, picture of the same scene. And we will see this more into detail when we go to the week two and uh, understand the satellite imageries. Uh, Typically, there are two types of uh, instrument, uh, low spectral resolution, such as MODIS, and then there are hyperspectral uh, sensors, which are like OMI and AIR. So these hyperspectral uh, sensors make measurement on every single wavelength. Uh, they have a, sp a spectral resolution of one nanometer or higher, uh, whereas this low spectral resolution sensors, MODIS, they have a, a spectral resolution of 20 nanometer or more than that. Uh, here is an, an example of a spectral resolution important. So again, if you want to get information about the specific uh, uh, geophysical quantity on the Earth or in the atmosphere, then depending on their spectral behavior for that uh, 
interaction with incoming solar radiation, uh, you will need different type of spectral resolution. So if you have a broadband instrument, then it will be very hard to differentiate between the different classes. But if you have a narrow band instrument, hyperspectral instrument with high spectral resolution, then you can actually differentiate between different classes. So spectral resolution uh, becomes very important when we want to separate things in the atmosphere or on the Earth's surface. Uh, another important is radiometric resolution. Uh, the, uh, these image data are represented by basically positive digital number uh, that varies from 0 to uh, a selected power of 2, you know, less than 1 of that. And the maximum number of brightness level available depends on the number of bits uh, used to represent the energy recorded. So whenever the satellite make measurement, it records the energy in terms of the voltage and in terms of the digital numbers. And depending on the technology which has been used or the space available for storing the data on the satellite, uh, you can assign some certain number of bits uh, uh, for each measurement to be recorded. Uh, larger these numbers, uh, higher the radiometric resolution and the imagery become sharper. So here we have a just an example. Uh, there are uh, one bit, four bit or eight bit sensors. So if you have one bit, so you will have only two levels, zero and one. So you can only see, say, black and white. But if you have a four bit sensor, uh, then it will have a total 16 levels, 0 to 15. And then you can see the shades of black and white on this. Uh, if you increase the number of bits used for recording, uh, for example, if you use 8 bit, then you will have a 256 levels where you can actually uh, see many more uh, shades of black and white. So similarly, uh, the current uh, air quality sensors, MODIS, MISES are 12 bits, so they can have close to 4096 level. Uh, there are other sensors which has a different number of bits uh, and they can record them. So again, the radiometric resolution is important in uh, I, how precise the measurements are. Uh, again, here is an example of uh, how the radiometric resolution can affect. Uh, the first picture is taken using the two levels, so you can see only black and white, like I said earlier. Uh, the second picture is taken using four level sensors, so you can see some shades of black and white and you can start uh, uh, looking into different features. But if you have a sensor with eight or 16 levels, then you can actually start looking into specific features on the Earth's surface and you can see the different shades of black and white. Uh, so just imagine when you have a 4096 level from the MODIS sensor, you can do uh, distinguish a lot more features and that's the beauty of satellite data actually uh, when we use this um, high uh, radiometric resolution sensors to do their quality you know, work. Uh, temporal resolution depends on the swath width, as I explained earlier. Uh, uh, in this picture, if you see this bit of this orbit uh, across this, this is defined as swath width, as I defined earlier. So temporal resolution is defined by how frequent uh, a satellite can provide observation on the same area on the Earth. Uh, it mostly depends on the swath width of the satellite. Larger the swath, higher the temporal resolution. Uh, Typically, uh, polar orbiting satellite provides one or two days uh, in a uh, repeat cycle or the temporal resolution they have. Uh, whereas the geostationary satellite, which look at one place on the Earth, continuously can provide much more high resolution, high temporal resolution data, ranging from 10 minutes to one hour. Uh, there's a trade off, uh, we call it remote sensing trade off. It is very, very difficult to obtain uh, extremely high spectral, spatial, temporal, and radiometric resolution at the same time. So depending on your application, uh, depending on the purpose of satellite or sensor, be compromised by one of this uh, resolution. So for example, MODIS does compromise on the spectral resolution, but it has very high spatial resolution. On the other hand, OMI sensor 
compromise on the spatial resolution. It has a 13 kilometer resolution, but it has a very high spectral resolution. And we do that because purpose of mode is, is to detect this uh, big picture type of things, cloud aerosols. Uh, on the other hand, uh, purpose of OMI is to detect this small you know, quantities in the atmosphere like ozone, NO2, SO2, which are specifically sensitive for specific narrow uh, bandwidth of incoming solar radiation. And to make those measurement, we need very high spectral resolution. So we always compromise with one of this resolution when we talk uh, design any specific sensors, uh, depending on the application. Okay, so I'm almost done with the today's presentation. Uh, we have a few more cues. Uh, to take and then we will take some question answer. So the first question is which satellite has higher spatial resolution? We talked a little bit about this so um, and you might have seen that in few of the slides I noted. Again the second question is uh, Sensor's ability to discriminate very slight difference in recorded energy is described as we just talked about it. And then another question is uh, frequent observations uh, over a certain region can be obtained by which type of satellites. So this depends on whether it's a geostationary or polar orbit. And the last question is basically true false. Uh, geostationary satellite can provide global coverage. So these two questions are interrelated actually. So let's take uh, a minute of time to answer this. And then we, I have a few more slides to go over and then uh, just uh, some informative slides, uh, nothing. And then we'll take question answer. Okay, so the first question is, which satellite has higher spatial resolution? Uh, so, since we did not talk specifically about the Landsat, uh, but it was mentioned on few of the slides, uh, but Landsat A has higher spatial resolution, it's uh, Current Landsat data has 30 meter resolution, uh, whereas the mode is 250 meter resolution. So the correct answer is the Landsat. Although we do not use Landsat for air quality application, uh, but sometimes you can use for the uh, surface mapping. The sensor ability to discriminate very slight difference in recorded energy is described by. So we talked about the recording of energy in terms of the bits. And those bits are related to the radiometric resolution. So the correct answer is the radiometric resolution. The next question is, uh, frequent observations over certain regions can be obtained using which satellite? And the correct answer for this is the geostationary because we are talking about hourly observation and to do that, uh, the satellite has to be in the geostationary report. Polar orbiting satellite cannot do that kind of thing. So the correct answer is geostationary satellite. And the last question is uh, true false statement. Geostationary satellite can provide global coverage. So again, if you answered this correctly, the previous question, this should be very, uh, the answer of this is false. So Geostation satellite cannot provide uh, global coverage. They can only provide coverage over a certain area. Uh, polar orbiting satellite does provide global coverage. 
uh, with that let's move on and I want to provide you some more uh, basic information so I'm going to move these questions away next week uh, we will talk about the satellite imageries uh, uh, how to use for a certain air quality application uh, what it means for information content how to identify different features uh, and then we will also do a hands-on exercise uh, for near real time uh, image access uh, using a tool called world view uh, and then we'll go over some of the application how we can use wide view to access near real-time satellite imageries here are some of the reference uh, and if you uh, which uh, we used to create some of the material which we presented today and some of the if you're really interested in learning more about some of the terms or if you by any chance did not uh, understood a specific terminology or want to really uh, learn more about fundamental of satellite remote sensing then there are several very useful tutorial online with the graphics and a lot of text for explanation uh, which you can go through and some of them are suggested here the good news for this is there is no assignment for this webinar series so we will not have any assignment we will try to uh, have this quizzes uh, in each session but we will no, have no assignment for you to work on uh, we get often uh, request for the certificates uh, and questions so in order to receive the certificate for this webinar series you must attend all the sessions either live or by using the recording which we put on our website and uh, when you see the recording we get the uh, we keep that record our software does uh, record that that information uh, how much you have watched uh, uh, that recording so based on those two criteria we issue the certificates uh, so please if you are requesting for a certificate make sure you have fulfilled those conditions uh, this is must required to issue a certificate all the materials uh, and the recording uh, from this uh, webinar series will be available on this link here uh, you can access uh, agenda uh, recording ppt uh, everything from this uh, website which is our side website and then again i have a contact information if you have a technical question from the today's session you can contact me uh, if you have a specific uh, logistic questions how to access material if you have um, trouble in finding a specific material you have question about any upcoming future trainings or any other software related uh, uh, trouble please contact brock uh, blevin uh, he will be happy to help you with that uh, i will be happy to take questions if you have thank you uh, you can type in your questions here in the chat window and i will try to answer them as much as i can so the first question is outside the NPP Sumi and Landsat aid, most NASA USGS uh, LEO satellite I can think of have exceeded their expected life. Can you give me more detail on upcoming US missions tempo? In particular, there will be a follow up to mode is outside viewers. Okay, so basically we will talk about the all these issues in the week five, but just to um, briefly answer your question yes uh, tempo is uh, a mission which is going to be launched uh, in about 2020 uh, the expected lifetime of tempo will be about five years and it's specifically designed to address several air quality issues in the US uh, modis is designed for three to five year and it is giving data for last 15 years and there are two modest sensors uh, now we have a 
the next generation the modis does not have exact follow up but it has veers which is provide almost similar information not exactly the same but almost similar information as modis and veers will have follow up missions so there is a uh, uh, it's a NOAA NASA partnership mission. Uh, there is a currently one VS which is launched in 2010 is working. Uh, in 2017, I think next year another VS will be launched on just uh, uh, another NOAA satellite. And there are more VS instrument which are already planned uh, for uh, upcoming missions. So VS will have continuous measurement for next uh, 20, 30 years, I would say. Um, but not exactly like MODIS, it has slight differences. And we'll talk those more details in week five. Okay. Another question I see is since OMI has uh, 1324 kilometer resolution, would it be possible to detect a specific constituent emitted from industrial stake? Okay, uh, this is a very interesting question. So yes, OMI's special resolution is coarse. Uh, detection of this emission from industrial stake will depend on uh, how consistent that emission is. Uh, so we, and are there any other source of similar emission in that region uh, that will determine. So if you have, only one industrial stake and there is no major source around that then what we can do is we can uh, accumulate data over time from that um, uh, uh, course resolution OMI sensor and we can actually because some of these emissions are short-lived so they will usually found near the source only and that way we can actually detect some of this but it has a limited application and probably need uh, a specific data processing uh, before detecting that. Uh, some of the example I can give you for this uh, is um, there have been a lot of fracking activities and when we do the fracking sometimes there are gas flares burning happens and in many cases we can detect these gas flares actually from using OMI data uh, by combining data over the time. And you, if you are really interested in that aspect, uh, please email me and I can forward you some of the papers uh, uh, where people have tried to do that, that kind of activity. Okay, there is another question. I think this is related to the Python code for comprehending modus data for AOD possible. Yes, we have. I am not really 100% sure if I understood the question, but we do have a sample Python code on our website which can uh, read the modus aerosol data. Okay, so there is another question which says why we don't use high spectral spatial red and high spectral spatial and radiometric resolution. Uh, the sh brief answer is that it's very, very hard to achieve all the resolution uh, technolo technologically. Uh, and then there are uh, economical constraints also. When you start uh, implementing this very high spectral spatial resolution, radiometric resolution, uh, things become very expensive and sometimes you don't really have, uh, uh, sometimes doesn't really require to have those kind of things. But as uh, technology is advancing, uh, we are getting it um, better on getting all kind of resolution at higher uh, resolution. Hyperspectral data is very discriminating on data. We learned that Hyperion will be off next year in other replacement. Okay, I'm not sure if I understood your question. So if you want, maybe you want to rephrase it. Can we 
model different type of air pollution sources like point source area source using sensors uh, we will talk about that in week two and week three uh, again depending on what kind of pollution uh, we are talking or what kind of source we are talking up to some extent we can do that uh, but not at limited level depending on the resolution which uh, sensor which we are using for example we can probably differentiate between biomass burning and dust uh, type of aerosols and industrial pollution aerosols but we may not be able to distinguish between industrial and emissions from the cars or vehicles Uh, there is a suggestion. Can you make a class on Python? Uh, uh, Python is very popular language, and uh, the, if you Google or search online, you will find uh, very useful tutorials. Uh, we have done a hands-on exercise using Python in our uh, uh, advanced webinar, and if time and resources permits probably we will uh, do more uh, uh, trainings uh, which will use python codes to uh, extract the satellite data okay so another question why landsat is not being used for air quality uh, difficult question uh, Landsat is very high resolution uh, and it has very, uh, it's designed to do the land mapping. Uh, it's 30 meter resolution. First of all, its coverage is very limited. Uh, it does not provide, uh, it takes around 16 days to provide a global coverage. Second is uh, when you work with this high, very, very high resolution data, then the signal to noise ratio becomes challenging very issue and retrieving uh, aerosol information or any other air quality information from landsat can be very uh, can have large uncertainties it does not mean that people have not tried using landsat uh, for retrieving aerosol information uh, there have been number of attempt uh, have been done in past uh, but there is no People have shown on a research basis it can be used to get the aerosol information, uh, but there is no operational product from uh, uh, for air quality from the land side. But that's an area uh, not exploited fully. And if you are interested, I will be happy to help you with that aspect because that's uh, if we can get that high resolution air quality information, that will be really good. Okay, I see a message from New Zealand. Thank you for attending. I know this is night time there, but I appreciate your time and interest. Okay, there's another question. How calibrated these sensors are with passage of time? Okay, so yes, that's a very important question. Uh, when this uh, satellite like i said designed for three to five years to work uh, it is very important to make sure that these sensors are uh, state their quality does not degrade uh, over the time uh, quality of these sensors and measurement quality does degrade so there have there is a specific team of people actually who uh, make sure that the sensors are calibrated and there's no problem in that. Uh, some sensors have onboard calibrations. They do once in a while calibrate uh, with the moon or other source in the space or on the ground, such as with, uh, which are relatively constant uh, over the time. Uh, and there are other lab-based uh, calibration which we do pre-launch. Uh, Sometimes we have to make adjustment to the calibration coefficients uh, 
as you may, uh, mentioned that uh, as time passes the uh, quality or the life of the sensor degraded uh, and to make sure their performance uh, or their uh, quality of the data they are providing is high uh, we have to continuously keep an eye on the calibration do some census data overlap if so which information used over the others and both use okay yes uh, many census data overlaps uh, and they the beauty of that is uh, each census provide different piece of information so if we can combine information from different census which overlaps then we can understand different uh, features about uh, specific objects or specific events in the atmosphere uh, another question can we use modis or land set to estimate air quality over city uh, the answer is yes and to learn a little bit more about that we'll talk in week uh, three uh, and four for on that more details Okay, there is a question on slide 22. Okay, I have to open the presentation. I don't remember what slide 22 is. Uh, okay. I think those are all uh, geostationary, just demonstrating how the geostationary satellite can make measurements. So you can consider uh, each color as a different uh, geostationary satellite. It's just uh, to show how things should work. Another question, do you combine data from the different instrument? Uh, yes, uh, very often. Uh, because each instrument, like I said earlier, provide a specific information. And if you want to understand complete picture or answer several questions, then often we have to combine uh, data from different sensors. With geostation satellite, any differences at night time? Also, why does Miser operate at an angle to other sensors? Okay. Uh, the geostation satellite does not, uh, uh, it depends on what we are trying to do, okay. So, like I said, uh, all these passive sensors, uh, it can be geostationary or polar, if they depend on the solar energy and if they are operating in visible part of the solar spectrum, then they can only operate in daytime. They cannot provide observation in nighttime for the obvious reason because there is no sunlight. Uh, although there are some measurements like cloud and uh, water vapor and temperature, uh, which can be uh, measured using infrared light and which is emitted by the Earth's surface and available at the night time as well. So we use that to obtain that kind of information, but not for the uh, aerosols or part particulate matter or trace gases. Uh, another question is why does MISER operate at angles to other sensors? Okay. Uh, so MISER is a multi-angle, multi-spectral uh, instrument. Uh, it has a four wavelengths on which it makes. And then it makes measurement of single piece of Earth in looking from nine different angles. Uh, when you look things from different angle, uh, you see a different view of the atmosphere uh, because uh, you can experience that by yourself. When you look things from one angle, you will see some uh, specific view but when you try to uh, turn your eyes up and down then you will see a different view uh, and same thing happens in the atmosphere uh, if there is a very thin layer of uh, dust or smoke or pollution in the air uh, and if you look down sensor is looking the down uh, it might miss it uh, but if you look it from certain angle you might be able to capture it so and also looking at different angles give a sense of uh, uh, height in the atmosphere. And we will talk about that when we reach to the uh, 
week three when we specifically talk about some of the uh, air quality possible to overcome the limitation of geostationary and polar satellite by placing one obliquely to one of them i'm not sure. okay sorry i'm not sure if i understand your question uh, if you can clarify it And then we have uh, some suggestion on uh, uh, making classes for correction and calibration of the instrument. Uh, thank you for that suggestion and we will think about it and see if we can uh, accommodate those kind of uh, uh, webinar series as well. Uh, those are very, very technical. Uh, so we have to see how we can accommodate those things. But thank you for your suggestion. And again, I think there is uh, uh, there are this question about how we can basically superimpose data from different satellites to get different piece of information. Uh, if you are used to the satellite data, then it's really easy to superimpose the data. Uh, you have to make sure the time and the uh, spatial coverage uh, matches uh, with what you are trying to do from different sensors. Uh, if you're new to that uh, satellite data, I would not suggest to do that approach because in order to superimpose data from different satellite, uh, you really have to understand details about the capability of each satellite and what is uh, what is the purpose. So depending on your purpose, there can be different methods uh, which we can imply to superimpose data uh, from two different instruments or more than two instruments. Okay, I think uh, I don't see any more questions. So if you have more questions, feel, feel free to email me. And uh, if you have other, uh, if you don't have any question, then I will just, uh, will just say thank you again for attending today's session. And